Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more overly sarcastic productions and this time the newest trope talk, Tone Armor. Now before I dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. And please do go check out the gaming channel here on YouTube where I just upload old stream VODs and dumb clips, a lot of dumb clips. Anyways, and also we are, you know, close to halfway to the uh, 500 subscriber count to be monetized over on that channel. So please, I'm really trying to push for that. Um, but also, if you are not someone that's going to watch that sort of content that is on that channel, um, don't subscribe because I think that might hurt the channel in terms of analytics. I don't know. YouTube is dumb. But anyways, tone armor. Now, supposedly, this is, according to Red, in the description box, this is different from plot armor. Um, kind of disagree because kind of plot and tone kind of go hand in hand sort of i feel like there are some plots you can't really talk about in certain you can't have certain plots in certain tones you know but um right like the tone of um avatar the last airbender a children's show you kind of um Right, the tone of that show kind of tunes you into what is going to happen. Um, there are, of course, still some surprises, but not to the who we know as the main cast. Um, right, uh, no surprises uh, there. Um, and the same carries over to Legend of Korra. Um, the Legend of Korra. I still, I still really like the finale to season one. Uh, the the death there that was they should have done something like that like kind of like an episode one or something to really set the tonal difference i don't know um cora i think had a lot of good ideas just was executed very poorly anyways i already mentioned avatar the last airbender before red could so ha <laughs> um star wars actually actually does a really good job i feel like of subverting this trope of tone armor, at least within uh, the Clone Wars series. Um, I thought they did a, a really good job. Though, of course, now it's kind of becoming the idea of character armor, if that's a term we can use. When it comes to Dave Filoni and Ahsoka Tano, he's never going to kill her, man. And it's just kind of painfully obvious sometimes the situations that Ahsoka finds herself in. Now, I love Ahsoka. I want to make that clear. Over my head there, uh, we have Jin Sakai right there, and then two Jin Sakai's left is uh, Clone Wars Season 7 Ahsoka Tano. Uh, the Funko Pops, because I love Jin Sakai, I love Ghost of Tsushima, and I also fucking love Ahsoka Tano. Um, I essentially grew up with her. I was like rough, I was a little bit, I think I was a couple years younger than Ahsoka was in the Clone Wars movie back in 2008 when that came out. Um, I dressed as Clone Wars version Anakin for that Halloween, that year's Halloween, just saying, just flexing. <laughs> um, <laughs> spirit Halloween costume. Um, so it was cheap as fuck. Though, of course, overpriced, but cheap material. Um, but anyways, rambling. Um, yeah, I don't really got anything else to add here at the beginning. I'm just kind of saying shit out of my ass. Let's dive in. <laughs> If you've ever engaged with the literary criticism space in any sort of action-heavy genres, you've probably heard the term plot armor. Plot armor is a phenomenon where a character's narrative importance and centralization in the plot provides them with a sometimes implausible level of protection against things- I thought she was about to say something in regards to how annoying it is sometimes to discuss and critique books uh, on the internet space. Um, now, as a, someone trying to be an author, my critiques are- I try and- be inherent uh, different than typical critiques um just as an author because they are my peers and so i try and phrase things differently um uh you know I, 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 if you ever hear me saying things like oh i would have you know done this differently i try and say i would have done this differently um i don't say uh it should have been this or this right um just because I have a different brain than the author, right? And they are my peer, right? You don't, 
as an author, I don't want to hear someone coming in and saying like, oh, you should have done this or this. I kind of find that a bit rude. Um, especially if, like, I think that's especially rude if it comes from um, someone, uh, someone that is supposed to be a peer. Um, and of course, I probably do make slip-ups, and if you watch some of my reviews, I may have slipped up like that and said should have done something different or whatever, um, in which case, not at all intentional. Um, but yeah, I try and just say, like, I would have done something different. I don't explain, extrapolate any further than that. I was just like, this wasn't, you know, my cup of tea. Uh, the decision made here wasn't, uh, I didn't, uh, not how I kind of, you know, saw things going or I didn't really, right? Like, I, we're getting, we're, we're rambling here about something completely unrelated. Things that would easily maim or kill a side character. Plot yeah. armor might let a main character walk off anything from a bullet to a building exploding because the purpose of these threats in story is not to kill the protagonist, it's to challenge Hey man, he's Aragorn, son of Arathorn, heir to a Lendil and a seal door, okay? He wielder of the blade reforged to increase the tension and or leave them vulnerable in interesting ways. Essentially, it doesn't matter how realistically deadly or damaging a hit should be. If they're a main character who needs to continue participating in the plot, they're not going to get one shotted. And plot armor doesn't just keep characters alive. It also keeps them active so they can continue to participate in the story and move the plot along. Even a non-lethal injury can dramatically slow the plot down. And there's a difference between a protagonist staggering out of a car crash with a limp and a protagonist spending two months recovering in a hospital and then yeah. another six weeks in physical therapy. Therapy. Plot armor mostly gets focused when it's being called out as a problem or a symptom of weak writing, but it's basically just a facet of suspension of disbelief, where the audience is expected to understand that a story randomly killing off a main character on whom much of the plot is dependent will probably severely impact that story's effectiveness. When we suspend our disbelief, we accept that sometimes the story makes the plot better by doing things that don't 100% make sense. But plot armor isn't the only factor that shapes how resilient the characters are. After all, plot armor is for <clears throat> important characters only and does absolutely nothing to protect side characters, background extras, a main character's beloved extended family, etc. But even without the protection of plot armor, background characters in one story might walk off the kind of damage that would have fully exploded them in another. In one story, it might be unthinkable to ever see visible... Okay, I see where she's going with the... Uh with tone armor now yeah 100%. blood while in another it might be impossible for a character to get through a grocery trip without getting doused in three pints of the stuff this is a phenomenon that i've taken to calling tone armor through every genre and every form of media every story sets a tone now tone is a deceptively massive concept influenced by a ton of factors and because it's basically another word for vibes we're not going to be able to nail down a rigid set of rules for defining it it's shaped by the feel of the dialogue the emotional range of the characters the density of jokes the musical score the ambient lighting and color grading the statements it makes on human nature, the character choices it rewards or punishes, the tone of the story is the sum of a massive number of parts. In a way, it's kind of like the temperature of a room. A lot of factors are influencing it, but you're basically only going to notice it if it makes you uncomfortable or if it's changing rapidly. And the thing is, the tone of a story does fluctuate, sometimes significantly. Some stories get progressively more mature and dark over time. Some go from episodic, disconnected adventures to overarching grand-scale threats. Many games let their narrative stakes escalate alongside the protagonist's power level 20 kill god for scaling some shows have notably dark episodes that are memorably scarring and there's a whole oh my god that episode of teen titans man haunted me that oh that episode and the finale as a kid were episodes i thought about a lot because they were like they were dark right they were serious subject material um that I did not really grasp as a child, but they were just like, still just something about them was inherently terrifying to me that they just stuck in my brain. I was like, oh. And there's a whole set of tropes based around a story hitting unexpected. Cerebus syndrome. When a story starts light and gets serious, Knight of Cerebus, a character whose introduction heralds a dark tone shift. Cerebus callback, something light and funny is referenced in a new unhappy context. Uh, I'm do I'm, that's... I lo those are my favorite kind of stories to write. I mean, that's kind of what that's what I'm writing right now. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, these that was a fun one to 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 write in. Just I mean, you kind of do that with all stories, honestly. Um, I mean, a lot of it within the fantasy genre, though, is. Um, because fantasy genre loves its prologues, right? And the prologues tend to uh, be, um, 
an example of the more serious tone that comes later, right? Um, it's it's something that that when you're taught creative writing, um, yeah, there there is a thing where you're taught kind of like um, you kind of want to establish uh, what your readers can expect from the beginning, um, and I've I kind of disagree with this. I think the readers especially fantasy readers do expect things by the end to get serious um to at least have a much more serious uh tone by the end because that's when the stakes have risen um f just in terms of very simplistic plot beats and stuff like every story essentially does that um you expect your story to start out lighter and get more serious um it doesn't like it could still be like a, a uh, um, a funny, light-hearted movie, like a Disney movie. Let's go with a stereotypical Disney movie. Those obviously start out light, um, and throughout the majority of the film, um, majority of the story, they are light-hearted stories. But they still incorporate. Uh, they still have those serious moments within them, um, right? Uh, you know. Uh, I'm trying to think of some good examples, but really, just think of any uh, Disney movie, uh, any animated movie, and they all have light tones, and then they get serious for a little bit, and then once they beat the villain, things go back to being like lighthearted pretty quickly, um, right? And that's you know that's an example of this, um, like. Yeah, anyway, but also prologues are useful for displaying, like, the, uh, um, showing the reader that, hey, there is a overarching theme here, an overarching, st a larger overarching story than the story that you're going to get through the POVs, right? That's kind of, it's kind of, that's what the prologue is essentially there for, to be like, yo, there's more going on here than what you're going to witness through the POV hard by taking a turn that's outside the current scope of the expected tone. If you want to look into some of those tropes, a lot of them are bundled under the Cerebus oh Syndrome boy. umbrella, which describes stories that establish a relatively lighthearted tone and then take an unexpected turn into extremely dark directions. It's rare for stories to go the other way, except in the sense that dark stories can have happy endings, but I'm sure it's happened somewhere. The thing is, DB... I have a feeling that George R. R. Martin is essentially doing this. Sort of. Kind of, sort of. Right, uh, Game of Thrones starts off very serious, is essentially very serious from the get, um, and it's only just kind of gotten more and more depressing. We're at the point where I, I think Winds of Winter would be the start of it going towards the good, um, where the good guys start to win, because George is a master writer. Um, he knows like the rules, and he knows how to break them. Right, You don't break the rules until you know them. And understand them intrinsically, and George knows them, and he so he knows how to break them. Um, if we ever get Winds of Winter, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think this the tone that George has set is he's going to be breaking that tone in Winds of Winter, and I mean, I know he has said that they're, uh, um, you know, the whole it's going to be not necessarily a happy ending, but I think in terms of tone wise. He is telling a very similar story, kind of to Lord of the Rings, in terms of good prevailing over evil and stuff like that. He is just making it a lot more complex uh, in terms of the character narrative. The thing is, deviating from a story's established tone is a powerful tool. If a story never shows blood, even a single visible drop can be immensely impactful. But in order to get the power from breaking those rules, the rules need to be solidly established first. Yes. And with something as vibes-based as tone, those rules are set down subtly. The tone of the story gives the audience an expected range of what kinds of things can or can't happen. This can range in scale from good will always triumph in the end and heroic intentions will be rewarded because this is a story about good people being vindicated and this is, this is what I'm doing in the story that I'm currently writing. Um, uh, it, the story I'm currently writing actually is perfect for this uh, trope talk here. It starts out um, right. We how you how you want to write these uh, in terms of tone armor and the tone shift is 
you are sprinkling it, it like it starts off pretty maybe lighthearted it's just gonna have some subtle reference some re maybe in the first chapter you have a bit more um references to a more serious undertone um just to make it so that the reader kind of is subconsciously aware of the things happening in the undertone like underneath uh, or in the overarching thing just so the reader is aware just subconsciously then when those and then throughout the book yeah uh, after that first chapter first segment you hold back on them for a little bit and kind of sprinkle them in here and there but then as the story is progressing and you're going up and up closer to that climax they're kind of getting mentioned a bit more and more so subconsciously right you're thinking back to the beginning and you're seeing that right uh at least that's how I'm, if if i'm writing this correctly this is how i do it this is what i think works real well um this is how i like it done um and so it's just becoming more and more and you're just realizing and then of course a really good writer what i'm trying to do is then having those if they were to do a reread they can be like wait a minute this this problem that really was being mentioned at the forefront here was also over here it just wasn't being really expressly talked about right that's and so you have that reread value to your book uh to your writing that i really am trying to focus hard on doing um um I just want little tidbits here and there, slowly building up the momentum uh, and the serious nature of it, the serious overarching themes and things like that. And kind of just like, not necessarily tricking you because you're aware of it as it's going on, but just like slowly building that um, dark tone. I don't know. I can't think of a proper better to just for whether it. or not characters can oh, swim oh god i've been talking for 17 minutes and we were only three minutes into this video there are more than once a movie the tone of a story is kind of a soft edge oh, probability man. map of what kinds of things can be expected to happen in the story versus what kinds of things are quite unlikely in classic heroic fantasy the tone makes things like good guys win in the end fairly likely and protagonist randomly takes an arrow to the face halfway through rather unlikely in a zombie apocalypse the tone makes a happy ending for all main characters catastrophically unlikely but it's also pretty unlikely that the main character is going to die to anything other than a zombie bite since the tone typically centralizes that as the core of the underlying horror and anything else would be almost a letdown. Although, if it's a zombie apocalypse where the tone is more broadly nihilistic, the main characters can theoretically die from anything since- Here's the fucking thing though, and I hate this example of Last of Us 2 for this, because Last of Us 1 was not that. Last of Us 1 had a hopeful message at the end. Yes, the means in which what Joel did is messed up, right? Not at all taking away from that. But the things that they said in Last of Us 2 in regards to the hospital just don't add up to the initial, what the hospital was initially like. They don't, and I guess you can play around with the whole, oh, we are in Joel's head uh, when we go through The Last of Us. No, they are essentially presenting this to us as facts. Uh, you can find fucking notes around the world. That essentially, I feel like, contradict the statements that Last of Us 2 is trying to make and the themes that Last of Us 2 is trying to say were there from the beginning or whatever. They weren't. Last of Us 1 is a very hopeful message, has a very hopeful ending, and then Last of Us 2 is just like, actually, no, fuck you, you suck. Everything is awful. The world is terrible. There is no hope. I hated that. I hated it. Or while they tried to have, like, a tried to spin it as still sort of hopeful and like ellie's having now that she's kind of moved on she'll have a better chance at living past joel or whatever fuck fuck off i hated it i hate last of us too 
meaningless random cruelty serves the tone. If anything, the most unlikely outcome in a zombie apocalypse is anyone behaving like a decent human being. In an episode of Scooby-Doo, the tone forecast suggests a surfeit of wacky shenanigans and traps, but it's very unlikely that we're gonna see Shaggy throw out his back from carrying a 140-pound Great Dane. Realistically, hmm. none of these unlikely events are actually impossible. They just don't fit the vibes, and thus the characters are invisibly protected from them, a kind of armor that they acquire from the tone. A story that takes a comedic, cartoony tone will likely play fast and loose with the laws of physics, and the characters will correspondingly be extremely sturdy. A character face to face with a bomb will be reduced to an ash pile with two blinking eyes. A character that gets shot with a gun will have their duck bill cartoonishly spin around their face. <laughs> a character careening off a cliff will explode and then be back one scene later. In this established tonal context, it would be extremely jarring for a character to get hit with a mallet and consequently be hospitalized with a brain injury, or even for a character to get a paper cut and visibly bleed. The tone of the story doesn't allow for it. This is tone armor, the set of assumptions and standards that a story's tone establishes specifically in the context of endangering the characters. Despite what the cartoonish example might imply, tone armor is not actually a case of more realism equals darker story equals nastier injuries. For one thing, humans in real life are deceptively durable and capable of surviving some pretty bananas things, but in, for example, sword and sorcery fantasy, the heroes might swing their way through an army of minions and take them all down permanently with one sword stroke or light stab each. This this is a yeah. combo of plot and tone armor, where the bad guy's status as faceless side characters affords them negative plot armor and lets a stiff breeze knock them over for convenience of pacing. But it's also tone armor, because a hero bloodlessly dancing their way through an army of goons is quick and clean and exciting to watch, and it spares us from watching any slow or icky consequences to that kind of combat. We don't see those stricken minions slowly and horrifically die in a field hospital like we'd expect from the tone of a tragic war movie, and we also don't typically see half of those minions stand up again with minor scratches on their sturdy leather armor ready for another go, like we might expect from real life. In this case, tone armor dictates that faceless minions basically get one hit point each, and when they're hit, they're cleanly down forever, which is not innately realistic. It just makes for good fight choreography, and it adheres to the heroic fantasy tone. Tone armor is largely defined by the preferences of the writer and the kind of story they want to tell, but sometimes it's also affected by outside factors, one of which is intended audience. The younger an audience yes. for a story, the less likely that story is to expose its audience to certain kinds of danger or injury. It's not seen as appropriate, and while plenty of kids are super down with murder, certain kinds of body horror can stick with you if you aren't prepared for them, so they get glossed over or kept off screen or replaced with a more bloodless, non-lethal variant of the threat. Also, lots of stories for younger audiences skew more comedic, and in the interests of tonal consistency, if you're aiming for haha -ha comedy fun times, you probably don't want to interrupt the good times too much with visceral unpleasantness. Cartoon violence doesn't tend to overlap with haunting violence. There's also intended audience factors that have almost nothing to do with age and everything to do with genre. For instance, if you're writing some sort of romance, the only injury a character can likely expect is the kind that artfully lays them up in bed so their love interest can care for them without any messy side effects or complications. In this case, tone armor will keep the characters whole and pretty no matter what kind of horrible things they're going through because being pretty is kind of foundational to the genre and to the appeal to its audience. The other big outside factor that can affect tone armor is standards and practices. A lot of stories are affected by the presence of no. a distributor or an yeah. editor looking over the creator's shoulder and telling them things like, you can't show that on television. It's a form of moderate to severe censorship that is the trade-off many stories make in exchange for widespread distribution, and it very commonly manifests in hard limitations placed on the story's tone. For instance, it's very common for kids' TV shows to shy away from blood, which means characters might end a fight covered in anime scuff marks or bleed an unusual color to take the edge off, or only ever fight robots that bleed robot juice. In some cases, standards and practices might shy away from acknowledging death at all. This was weirdly common in 90s to 2000s anime dubs that had to take the source material and make it appropriate for an American Saturday morning time slot, which led to things like Yu-Gi-Oh's Shadow Realm, which exists in the original but gets much less screen time, because pretty much any time a character is in danger of being sent to the Shadow Realm in the dub, it's because the actual stakes were death. Death is not okay, but a horrifying death-like hell dimension is totes kid-friendly. And like, yes, that's objectively hilarious logic, but it's a form of tone armor that has a legitimate impact on how the story feels. Replacing buzzsaws with with dark energy discs that send you to the Shadow Realm if they touch you is very funny and very stupid, and I feel so bad for the team that had to paint over all those buzz saws and also erase my Valentine's cleavage in every shot, but it establishes hmm. boundaries on the story's tone that the standards and practices people thought were more in line with a Saturday morning time slot for kids. The lower bound on the tone is having your soul sent to a nightmare dimension where you would probably not have a good time but could potentially be rescued. It is not having your legs sliced off by a saw trap. Considerations like this are all in service to keeping the tone light, although some forms 
of censorship backfire, and they frequently diminish the impact of parts of the story that are actually supposed to be notably dark. I don't want to keep beating up on Yu-Gi-Oh!, but Season 4, The Evil Bikers from Atlantis and Objectively the Best Season, featured villain characters with backstories like Entire Family Died in a Shipwreck and War Orphan with Dead Little Brother, and the dub kind of had to work overtime to change those to Dude Who Got Shipwrecked All By Himself and Turned His Back on His Family and Little Brother Got Kidnapped by a Tank, which makes the part at the end where they're heartwarmingly reunited with the ghosts of their dead families kind of a giant confusing plot hole. When a yeah. writer wants to write a story... This is why I think, uh, as a kid, I think you could kind of... I think especially children are able to kind of see that kind of thing, and especially when they start developing their own... the stuff that they personally enjoy more, uh, they're able to notice it especially and then lean toward... Like, right, I've said before, I'm a big... I, I was a fan of Naruto growing up, um, series one. Because it was a show that showed the violence. It didn't shy away from it, despite it being on Cartoon Network at the time. Um, uh, you know, characters fucking died, right? You see Gara fucking just like a dude. Uh, the, um, the first arc, the Land of Waves arc, dude. Like, it's just... It's fucking hardcore for a child to watch, at least com compared to everything else that was around at the time, right? Um, and I also disagree with the whole, like, uh, you know, I think Naruto's balance, the dub, I watched the dub um, of Naruto series one. I thought the balance that it had there with uh, its violence and the killing um, was appropriate. I think that was appropriate for uh, uh, a you know, a child audience, you know, I thought they did a good, I thought that was acceptable, right? I would, I would let my child watch uh, Naruto series one, um, when they were like, once they're like four or five or whatever, um, I'd let them watch it because that's when I watched it. <laughs> With deadly stakes, but okay. is forced to adhere to a tone armor paradigm that refuses to even acknowledge the existence of death, the story can suffer and the characters might end up getting threatened with something that's even worse but technically PG. Tone armor is an invisible paradigm established by a story that quietly teaches the audience what level of danger and brutality they can expect from the story. Most of the time, you will only think about tone armor when you see it break. And tone armor can break. In fact, breaking tone armor is one of the easiest ways to gut punch the audience because it hits them in a way they didn't realize they could be hit. One of the most common and powerful ways tone armor can be broken is probably pretty obvious because it's also a break in plot armor, killing a main character. Before a main character dies, the tone of the story passively indicates that this is impossible. Main characters are protected from danger by plot armor and general narrative importance. Death might not even be a concept in this story except as a vague implied threat if the heroes fail to save the day, which they won't. And then something happens. Maybe they hit a season finale and have to do a boss rush to get to the final battle and the big guy takes a hit and doesn't get back up. Maybe the new bad guy is such bad news that they straight up murder someone just to prove they can. Maybe the power-up that always saves the day gets cut off mid-theme music when the hero gets fully backstabbed. Something oh. happens that- Avatar The Last Airbender that season two is masterful. Like season one is pretty weak, honestly, but seasons two and three are just masterpieces has never happened before, and it changes the game. When a main character is built up for the express purpose of killing them off to show the stakes, this character is called a sacrificial lion, and despite their appearance as a standard main character, most of these characters are constructed specifically to die. It's just a matter of how well the writer can conceal this fact before the point of impact. And the thing is, while this is usually used to expand the lower bound of the story's tone and make it feel like anyone can die, it doesn't usually mean that anyone can actually permanently die now. Because again, plot armor exists for a reason. There was this really funny trend, it was funny to me anyway, in like the early 2010s where every popular show that was hitting the market was selling itself on the premise that anyone could die. Yep. Attack on Titan, Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead. I distinctly remember all these shows getting pitched as these dark, serious stories where being the main character wouldn't save you and that's what made it cool. And they all have a moment where someone central and important dies to prove that that's a thing that can happen. But the thing is, a story where anyone can actually die is a story where a lot of threads are going to go 
unresolved, which is a bad story. Like, if it leaves too many plot threads dangling, it's bad at being a story. So most of these stories end up outfitting their leads with a nice set of plot armor after a season or two, which I remember disappointing the people who've been pitching them as dark, badass, anyone-can-die narratives. But, like, that doesn't mean this form of breaking tone armor doesn't have an impact. It reshapes the feel of the world by proving that being central to the plot is not enough to protect a character. I think, again, this goes into the point that Red was talking about earlier about the author's goal, right? Like, George R. R. Martin, like, what separates Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, from the others that were doing this, though, at least up until, you know, the last three, four seasons, season five, six, seven, eight, those crash, um, what, what separates a, a Song of Ice and Fire in George's work is that George is purposeful in who is dying because those are threads that he wants. They're going to resolve in a different way, right? Like Ned, likely the next time, right? right uh, if Ned were sent to the wall, he probably would have told John the truth, right? By then, right? They were both at the wall. It didn't really probably matter anymore. Um, Ned probably would have told John the truth of his lineage uh, at the wall, but with Ned and right, like, uh, and Ned being sent to the wall, of course, also stops some conflict from happening um but ned being killed leaves um the thread of john's parentage still open to continue to be explored and theorized and things like that and of course other plot beats uh, uh I, i'm trying to think of some other deaths that have rob stark's death um that leaves open some I really wouldn't say that the deaths in Game of Thrones actually, the plot threads that are left open, I guess you could say, from a character's death, um, get outweighed by the, the story that comes from their death, the consequences that their death has on the world, and what happens post death, um, for and that that character's memory, right? Like I think that um, outweighs perhaps the inability for this character's plot threads to be wrapped up or whatever. But like in terms of some other shows um, and how they kill off characters, they just kill them off to right for that advertisement bit of like, Oh, we are, you know, anyone can fucking die, you know, except that's not true. There are certain characters that won't die because um, for whatever fucking reason. Before we see it happen, we don't believe it can happen. There are other ways tone armor can be broken without necessarily killing anyone. For instance, sometimes the tone of the story is secretly being carried by one character. One ridiculously overpowered protagonist who single-handedly makes the threats they deal with look easy, one very skilled and smart hero who keeps their villainous rival in check, one character who keeps the tone light and then the story gets rid of them. Maybe they're dead, maybe they're missing, maybe they're just yeeted out of the story for a while. Whatever happens, they aren't around to help anymore, and the rest of the characters have to deal with the stakes they leave behind. It turns out this character was doing a lot to keep things manageable, and without them essentially shielding the rest of the story, the dark parts of the plot get a lot darker. They do this in the Helsing OVAs, where Alucard is such a hilariously overpowered nightmare that in order to make the villains actually threatening, they lure him out and stick him on a boat for half the series, and while he's stuck on the boat, nearly everybody else dies when London is blitzkrieged by Nazi vampires. It's not the first time anyone dies in the show, but it's the first time the main characters end up in actual serious danger because they don't have their pocket eldritch abomination around to save the day. They also do this in ba da ba Reboot Season 3! As if I would get through this video without highlighting the tonal downturn that defined my childhood. The first two <laughs> seasons of Reboot are goofy, mostly wacky episodic adventures with the occasional tonal whiplash in the form of a season finale or unusually devastating scheme from the main villains. Then at the end of season two, trickster paragon protagonist Bob gets bundled into a rocket and fired into space, or rather the computer equivalent of space, the web, which is worse than space because it has Twitter in it. And without yeah. Bob, things get bad. Kid protagonist Enzo does his best to live up to his hero's example in single-handedly holding off these suddenly much bigger and scarier threats, and despite being a little kid and not a trained badass antiviral program, he holds it together decently well for a few episodes until he gets stuck in a Mortal Kombat game and loses his fucking eye in a show where the previous worst fate a hero could experience was a bad haircut. Things only get worse from there, with the kid heroes getting time-skip training montaged into grown-ups while trapped in the games, and back home sees the destruction of basically every 
iconic location from the first two seasons and the near total victory of the big bad. And what makes this form of tone armor breakage work most effectively is that when the vanished shield character would God, I could not watch this. Even even if I had watched it at the time that it was coming out, I would not have been able to fucking stand that animation turns things start getting good again these characters are such powerful forces that they just make things better around them and when the heroes find them or save them or they just make it back on their own everything starts getting better in a way that didn't seem possible when they were gone the tone of the story follows them when they're gone the villains can run rampant but when they're around the story can have a happy ending and honestly this is a remarkably effective way to make an otherwise kind of basic protagonist very impactful if their presence in the story is what keeps the other characters safe if their absence is what makes the story dip into tonal darkness that otherwise never happens, it's a very solid way to show don't tell how truly effective they are and how much they're doing for the story. One sneaky aspect of tone armor is that a lot of stories will threaten stakes that they would never actually pay off. This is extremely common in any sort of action setting where the implicit threat of main character death hangs over pretty much every combat encounter, or in stories where the villain's machinations threaten the end of the world as we know it. And while these are theoretical elements of the tone of the world because the story acknowledges them as possibilities, unlike, for instance, stories where death is not even acknowledged as a thing that can happen, they're kind of in a state of plausibility flux. The story recognizes that they are real threats, but never actually brings them into reality, so the audience doesn't necessarily buy them as part of the tone. A superhero story will threaten the apocalypse, but the mere existence of superheroes forestalls it from ever hitting, or in yeah. the worst case scenario, lasting longer than a week. In these cases, tone armor can be cracked with temporary forays into what-if scenarios, or more commonly, in-season finales or big crossover arcs, which is usually when the threats are allowed to get more which is why i think uh like endgame ugh, endgame i have such complicated feelings on because again like the idea of having that lasting effect of of the snap and the people remaining gone is very uh dark um and could potentially be not good in the long run i think i would have preferred that over uh what they chose to do with the five-year time jump and then they finally go and fix it i don't know it just run me the wrong way the end game just kind of flopped the promise uh the potential post infinity war i feel like more present and real, and heroes switch from apocalypse prevention to apocalypse repair. These are odd little stakes cul-de-sacs, where the story briefly gets a lot more perilous, but then snaps back to normal, establishing that the story can get that dark, but it won't stay that dark for long. This is how you can smoothly get unexpectedly dark single episodes of otherwise mostly lighthearted stories without it being ridiculously jarring. If the level of danger experienced in the one-shot Extreme Peril arc is in line with the level of danger threatened by the rest of the story, it's not completely story-breaking, it's just pleasant pleasantly tense. And that's kind of a narrow balance to strike. Tone armor is a mostly invisible element of storytelling that I frankly have never seen anyone directly discuss, but it plays a huge role in how stories feel and what a writer can do with them without dislodging or confusing their audience. Breaking a story's established tone armor is always an impactful moment. The first time we see a character bleed or break a bone or just straight up die is the first time the story proves it's willing to go there and could potentially go there again. But breaking the tone too violently risks relinquishing the story over into the joint custody of comedy and tragedy. Thus far, we've really only talked about stories that break their tone armor in relatively small ways, going from no blood to one drop of blood, or threatening Armageddon to taste testing Armageddon, or this character has been successfully protecting us to the character's gone and the things they were protecting us from are actually really bad. Shifts that are one step outside the established tonal range. That's because if a story breaks its own tone armor by going from Yo, zero really to a hundred, it's not darkly impactful, no, it. it's it's jarring. It'd be like the third time this year. Hilarious. Mm. Characters experiencing realistic consequences from cartoonish violence is a common dark joke. Genre bending lighthearted cartoon characters into dark and gory scenarios is used for instant shock factor. Everyone makes fun of the CW for taking colorful kids media and sexing it up for live action and whatever the hell else they did with Riverdale before they finally let it die, because that kind of shift is intrinsically funny. Everyone took the piss out of Sonic Forces when they dropped this little chestnut. Hell. Well, hold on, I gotta read it.
He's captured in the orbiting prison. My spy there says he's in a solitary confinement cell and they've been torturing him That's for months. Hell, what? just That's... transposing wacky animated violence into the context of a live action adaptation can take a fight scene from feeling wacky to feeling uncomfortably visceral. When tone armor is broken, the first thing it does is make the audience feel unsafe. There was previously a narrow band of conceivable stakes that the story stayed within the boundaries of, and breaking the tone armor breaches those borders, and that means the audience no longer knows what to expect. The characters are in danger in a way they weren't before. That kind of subversion of expectations can be played up for tragedy, comedy, or both, but it can't be pushed too far if the intent is to keep the audience in the story. If you break the rules too hard, the audience gets jarred loose and stops being invested because they have no idea what to expect anymore. There's a reason it's inherently hilarious to consider where you would put a single F-bomb in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. No matter where it goes, it will never fit the tone. That's why it's funny. Trying yeah. to do it seriously would be like ice skating uphill. If you break the invisible rules, that have been holding the story in shape this whole time, sometimes all the audience can do is laugh and then disinvest because once the punchline is over, the audience leaves. So, yeah? I'll be honest, I've done some weird trope talks. This is probably the first one where I was like, man, I hope, I hope any of this makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was kind of getting that vibe. Um, That's trope talk tone armor. Tone armor. I wouldn't say that this is Red's strongest. I personifying death, death. I think is going to be a hard one for Red to beat. That one was just a masterpiece of a trope talk. Um, I mean, the subject matter, of course, being a more serious one, but the way she conveyed it was just perfect in that video. This one, you're right, a weirder one, um, but still welcome. I still enjoyed it. I enjoyed pretty much all of these trope talks. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed as well. Uh, remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.